Today is an important day for DB2, Linux, Unix, and Windows. The uh, beta for the next release, codenamed Wiper2, is out. And I'm walking down the hallways of the IBM Toronto lab to see if I can find someone who will tell us about Wiper2. So here we have Tim Vincent, who who better to tell us about Wiper2 than the chief architect himself. So let's uh, knock on his door and see if uh, Tim's going to be able to talk to us. Hey Tim, how you doing? Not too bad, Rob. How are you? Come on in. Pretty good. You have a couple of minutes to tell us about Wiper2? Yeah, definitely. All right. So how do these things work? Do they lock you up in, uh, in this room and don't let you come out until you figure out what's going to be in the next release? Yeah, that's when I'm, when I'm not on a plane or going off to see customers or partners. <laughs> it's rare I'm in this room alone, actually. Okay, Tim, can you tell us about Wiper 2? What have you been doing over the last few years? What is in Wiper 2? So last time we talked, Rob, I, I think it was actually last time we were in Toronto, we were in a hotel in Delhi. So a completely different continent this time. When, when we talked about Viper, we talked about our thrusts around SAP and their relationship and partnership with SAP. That, that's continuing to be a critical aspect. Uh, we've talked about warehousing and the whole thrust in the warehousing space and how we see customers really, really driving more and more into the warehouse. They're pushing more value into the warehouse. The, the business demands in the warehouse, the uh, usage of the warehouse is growing greatly. So we've, we've actually put a lot of thought into what we need to do for the warehouse. And really the thought is on how we get more predictability on, on the workloads in the warehouse and how we get more overall availability on the workload on, on the warehouse as a result. From, um, from a security and privacy perspective, there's a lot going on in the regulatory compliance space. And we wanted to, to really drive value for customers around here to really help them um, with some capabilities in the database to, to lower their costs and, and improve what and what they do with some of the compliance rules. For SAP and for all our customers, um, and this spans not only OLTP but warehouse, we've got a huge focus on driving down the TCO of the product. Uh, the compression capabilities were an obvious TCO savings, but the TCO it is as much about driving down people costs, the cost you have to uh, apply to DB2 to manage and run the system. What we wanted to do is really, really allow you to free the skill up, make sure that the uh, amount of the valuable skill you do have in the organization is applied where it is really needed and, and try to factor out some of the more mundane aspects and continue to drive down the people costs. Finally, from an application perspective, we really want to make sure that um, there's capability in the application space that allows you to leverage DB2 and push more value, drive down the cost of, of developing applications and um, improve the time to value for applications. So XML is a continued thrust here obviously. And we've actually added some other very interesting uh, technologies to help improve what people do in the application space and not only from uh, developing new applications but also migrating existing applications. Okay, that sounds good. You mentioned that uh, warehousing is one of the key areas uh, for focus in Viper 2. What's in warehousing uh, specifically in terms of features and functionality? I'm going to talk about one item for warehousing. This, uh, this is a very big item. What we've noticed okay. is, especially with consolidation and the increase, um, increased business demands on the warehouse, more and more customers were seeing uh, a much greater variability in the workload. So we're seeing much more mixed workloads and much greater workloads coming into the warehouse. So what we wanted to do was um, allow, give customers a way to actually sandbox specific workloads and manage things at a workload level. Um, but, but more than just do the sandbox in the workloads, we wanted to help them manage, uh, get better control of what's coming into the system. So we've seen with um, some customers, actually with several customers, that they are struggling with the concept of row queries. So queries coming in, they were ad hoc in nature that are being um, constructed by tools, by uh, DBAs or application developers that were, were very hard to predict and they were actually having a much, much greater load in the system than they would have liked. They either ran a long time or they chewed up a lot of the I.O. bandwidth, et cetera, and we wanted to be able to give them controls on what's going on there. And, and, and finally, um, not only provide these capabilities of sandboxing, but and, and row query management also, but also give them ways of measuring what's going on in the system around these concepts. So we've, we've actually built into the, um, into the engine the whole concept of a workload manager. 
and, and you, you can think, if you're familiar with operating system workflow managers, what we've done is we've started pushing some of those concepts and philosophies into the engine. So we've started with the concept of a service class, which maps directly to what you have in a workload management, an operating system workload management uh, construct. So we have the concept of a superclass and a subclasses. What, what these um, classes are for um, is they provide you a way of managing your resource consumption. So things like CPU and I.O. priority get managed at a service class level. Now then this is only useful if you can actually map something to the service class where we've introduced the concept of a workload. And, and what this workload is, is it's a mechanism that allows you to define to the database um, what a workload is, and the workload can be defined by some of the things that you can set on the connection attribute as you, as you actually connect to the system. So now you have the concept of a workload, you can actually map the workload to a service class or a subclass. The next, the next construct we added is the concept of dividing a workload up, or if you don't have a workload, dividing your work up along the bounds of the type of work you're doing. So uh, operations like DML versus DBL, read operations versus write operations, store procedures, loads. So you can actually identify things down to that level and again further, di uh, further divide them into different subclasses. So now you've got a way of identifying work coming in, mapping it to a service class construct that allows you to actually manage the resources associated with, with, with that workload. But, but that's, that's only part of the picture. The next, the next piece gets to where, how you're controlling what's going into the system. So we've actually introduced the concept of thresholds. So you can define things that are either predictive or reactive thresholds. Oh, the best way to talk about this is an example. So you could set up a predictive, a predictive threshold that allows you to say, okay, what I want to do is if I have a query that comes into the system whose estimated cost is going to exceed a certain value, I want to actually capture information on that query. What, what was the query? What's the statement text if you want? What are the input values? What's the compilation environment? And some other basic statistics. You can then allow that query to run, and you can have a second threshold, which is a reactive threshold that says, now if this query actually exceeded this um, a specific execution time, I want to stop this. So what this allows you to do is now really control the workload coming into the system. Like I said, that for the predictive, predictive threshold, you can capture information. So the other aspect is comes to the monitoring and measurement of what's going on. So we've introduced a whole bunch of table, actually nine specific table functions that allow you to capture information and then easily access and look at that information via SQL. And we've also added some more event monitors to allow you to actually push out data as you exceed what these threshold values. Okay, so these are definitely very beneficial capabilities in the warehousing space.